talk to unified communications, which is a topic we haven't really gone into depth in the conference so far. I like to think of unified communications as a color wheel or palette of interpersonal communications that range from voice, all kinds of audio applications, video applications, messaging of many kinds, whether it be email, SMS, IM, any kind of text-based communication such as on Facebook or on Skype or any of the other social media, as well as collaboration. Now, this color wheel, if you like, is interesting, but where it starts to generate return on investment for enterprises is when it's integrated into the applications that are the workforces of a given company. So if it's integrated into your call center, then these communication modalities have value for you. If it's integrated into your CRM system or your ERP system or your financials, then you can start to gain productivity. Doing this isn't always straightforward. And as we start to move our applications from being on servers housed in our own data centers into the cloud, we have yet another integration problem. And it's not just the applications that we're trying to integrate. We want to integrate with various websites, including social media websites. We want to hit databases and other data repositories. And then we want to be able to take these applications, along with all the unified communication modalities, and integrate them into lots of different devices. And we've heard a lot about that this afternoon. I first put this chart together in 207. And in fact, I believe that this is still current today. There are really three ways that I see uh, unified communications readiness or IP telephony readiness. In the enterprise space, the first thing that enterprises had to do was get their infrastructure ready. They had to get rid of hubs and put in switches and basically QoS enable their infrastructure so that they could carry good quality, excellent quality voice and video. They also had to take a look at the data services that they were acquiring to patch their sites together and make sure that they were QoS enabled as well. The next stage, which really began in about 2004, was integrating applications. And this is an ongoing process, but it's not just integrating the applications. It's actually re-engineering business processes to go along with this. And then the final stage, which began in earnest in around 2008, was taking a look at these unified communications applications and moving them to a modality where they can be on any device, anytime, anywhere. And that's been a big theme in this conference. So I'd like to just point to a couple of mobile trends that can't be ignored. And I'd like to thank Christina Warren from Mashable for putting together a couple of really cool applications that I'm going to show you on this slide. Uh, the URL will be on the slide so you'll be able to look at this in detail. The first thing to look at, oh, it's not showing up very well, okay? Uh, the first one was location-based services. And the picture that you can't see was actually showing um, a person who happens to be near a pizza place and it popped up because their preferences were set that they liked pizza and it let them know that it was there. But if you can imagine in a business context, almost any kind of location-based service can be delivered to a mobile device using GPS. The next major trend has to do with integration with the cloud, and that is something that we've heard an awful lot about. The integration with the cloud happens because the cloud has APIs. In the picture that you can't see, we have an example of a storage company called Dropbox, where users who might have an iPhone are creating documents, upload it to the Dropbox site, and somebody on an Android or a Blackberry is able to look at that same type of document. Again, there are lots of potential applications that use unified communications that can take advantage of these things. The next is easy access to social media. And we've heard an awful lot about the rising use of Facebook and some great slides earlier today. And one of the concerns, of course, is security with all of this. And there are some um, standards out of, or AUTH, which allows for some level of privacy to be able to integrate with these social sites. And then the last major trend, and I'm not sure why the pictures aren't showing, but this was a picture of the iPhone that has front and rear facing cameras. And that again is going to contribute massively to the type of traffic that we see on networks. It's not just video that we're looking at here. One of the really interesting things that I learned 
group just recently, which was announced at the end of last year, is a chipset from Qualcomm that takes advantage of these two cameras that allows for augmented reality. And they've come up with the chipset in the software developer kit. And what that allows you to do is have the two cameras facing out, take a look at things that are around you, and then superimpose them on other things that are applications on this device. So the device itself may be a phone, it may be a tablet, it may be a portable computer, but that's going to generate a huge amount of traffic. And if I understand what the chipset can do, it can handle video from each of the cameras at about 30 frames per second. And that can generate massive amounts of traffic. And of course, in a unified comms environment, one can imagine a number of business applications that can take advantage of things like augmented reality. So the two things that I really want to explore in this panel. The first thing is anywhere, anytime, any device. And I think Natasha and I must have had some telepathy because we came up with the same terms, and so we're definitely on the same page. And really, it's the ability for end users to be able to roam from any network to any other network anywhere in the world from mobile to fixed and back again. But it's also about what do operators need to be able to implement this kind of service? You know, is there a space for operators to make money out of this? Massive growth of traffic. Who's going to be the one who wins on the revenue space? The next thing I wanted to look at is very much about monetizing the massive growth of data traffic. We've seen a number of slides throughout the last couple of days. Um, the $50 billion mark by 2020 in mobile devices. I've seen that from Ericsson as well as AT&T. Um, everybody is forecasting huge growth in mobile broadband bandwidth um, in terms of what's required and the information overload. But what happens in the operator space? You know, who's really going to make the money? Is it going to be the traditional cellular operators or is Skype going to eat their lunch out of the mobile devices? What's going to happen with devices that all flow to the Wi-Fi networks where it's not an operator network, let's say, that is actually carrying the traffic when someone is roaming around and they've got something else to connect to? And then the other parallel thing to this is today's devices, mobile devices, are smart and getting a whole heck of a lot smarter. And a couple of examples from some work that Ericsson has been doing in their vision of 2020. This is a picture of, device, of a device that's called Spider Mobile, and it's not very clear, but what happens is it's a handheld device. On either side, it has touch pads and sensors and cameras that both allow it to see and to project. In the picture, if it were higher resolution, you'd be able to see on one side it's projecting out a virtual screen, and on the other side it's projecting out a keyboard, and the camera is good enough to be able to sense which fingers you're typing and you know, which part of the keyboard you're seeing. So in effect, it's providing a mobile computer in something that's probably about this big. Another cool device is something called Living Tiles, and there's two examples of this. And basically, these are standalone devices that, when in proximity to each other, can act in a conjoined fashion. So you can arrange them to be able to put together really big graphs, really big spreadsheets, as we see in the middle picture, or do something really interesting like music lessons. So here they've got about four or five de devices that are hooked together to have a keyboard. Another um, two devices have a musical score. Um, over on the left side, the picture of the person is actually a video conference with the music teacher, and they're actually conducting music lessons over the public internet. And these are the kinds of devices that are going to be around in the year 2020. You know, if it's in the labs today, you can be sure it's going to be in consumer land, maybe even before 2020. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to our panelists, two of whom you know from earlier sessions, um, Natasha from Genban and Emmett from Teta. I'd also like to introduce Steve Lee from Betaswitch. Now before I turn to the panelists, I'd like to ask the service providers in the audience, how many of you offer unified communication services to your enterprise customers? Two? Okay. How many of you, too, offer those services across mobile devices as well? Both of you. 
Okay, and a number of service providers, obviously, that are not anywhere in this space. So the very first question I'd like to address to our panel, and Natasha, I'll put this to you first. What elements are required to bring enterprise applications to a mobile device, and how can one account for the different kinds of device screens and operating systems to be able to put these unified communications applications out into the roaming world? Okay, so um, clearly at the heart of all this is an application server uh, that provides the application. Uh, typically, most of this application server market originated on the fixed line side, um, actually not even so much on the consumer side, but on the enterprise side. Most of the applications that were developed were developed for enterprises. Um, now, with some intelligent integration uh, and putting the clients for those application servers on the mobile phones, uh, you have the ability to integrate these types of applications uh, in the mobile environment as well. In fact, uh, at Mobile World Con Congress, one of the solutions that we announced is this ability. Uh, what we saw is that if you look at uh, mobile service providers, um, we certainly see two here, but overall as we look at them, we see that typically the target market is consumer. And if you look at the penetration of the target market, it is almost at the top there. So as we talk to many service providers, and there's always the question of what else can we do to make more money? Uh, one of the things that we came up with, and actually we worked, we worked with some of our service providers, was that uh, can we open up new markets for you? Uh, can we perhaps open up the enterprise market for you? So with that came up the solution where we are able to enable the mobile service provider to offer uh, these um, you know, PBX-like uh, services and can be fairly sophisticated based on the types of applications they're looking for uh, in an environment where they can deliver all this on, on a mobile device. Do you, does the um, environment support different mobile operating systems? Absolutely. Uh, that's, that's the key requirement. Different operating systems, different clients. So there is, uh, there is an integration requirement that is, yeah. that, is, that is. And how do you account for different screen sizes? Because that is a big challenge. Screen real estate, you know, something that's you know, this small is going to give you a very limited view, whereas something that's the size of an iPhone will give you a much richer experience. Yeah, so uh, personally, I mean, this is not something Gentan produces themselves, but we have partners who produce clients, and those clients are customizable, um, and the resolutions of the screens, etc., is all customizable based on the different types of devices these solutions work with. Yeah. Steve, you're in a very similar line of business. Do you have anything to add to you know, this type of discussion? I think so. I, I think to me, what surprises me about in particular mobile operators in the US where, where I live is that they don't bring anything to me as an enterprise other than just phones and minutes. And, and I think the trick is to deliver more of an experience than that. Um, so for example, there's no reason why a mobile operator couldn't say, you know, here is your new phone, we've got a soft phone on there so it can also act as a remote extension of the desk phone. Um, that soft phone will bring in a round robin rotation if you wanted to buy the Motel I-100. Um, there's no reason why I couldn't have an auto attendance service on that mobile number. So that if I'm a small enterprise, I can have a mobile phone. When somebody calls me, it can say, you know, press zero to leave a message, press one for support, press two for sales, etc. So a lot of the things that as Natasha says we've seen in wildlife. Haven't translated to wireless yet, and yet this is very valuable. Those are very standard telephony type of applications. When I think about unified comms, it's really the deep integration of these different modal modalities, whether it be voice or messaging or video, ingrained in an application. How can you bring those ingrained applications to mobile devices and mobility in general? Well, look at me. Well, you, Natasha, <laughs> and it, you know, any one of you, you know. Have you looked at those issues? Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, just to sort of pick up where you left off on that. Um, yeah, some of that that we started with may be viewed as being a bit basic, but it's not done today. And so I think there's some, some obvious opportunities that are being missed. But in terms of making things multimodal um, and, and using this phone, I, I think maybe what I could do is, is just go off slightly into an area that is called uh, RCS and the Rich Communication Suite. Um, and, and what that threatens to bring to a lot of this area as well. Um, so if, if you kind of look at that environment, what RCS is trying to do is it's trying to 
uh, come up with a new global service which operates for revenue for uh, a service that will allow you to uh, share content through the call, start video, share photos, share contacts and location. Um, so you now start to get more of a sort of a multi-information experience with the club. Um, but RCS has taken a long time to get there. I need IMS, I need RCS servers, I need RCS clients, etc. And I think we're seeing developments now that get RCS-like features to market more quicker. And, and that experience there, we can talk about how that applies to the businesses, to person-to-person -person communications to dramatically enhance the phone call. We pretty much revolution. With RCSE in Barcelona, they announced trials by five European operators to basically integrate their mobile services across different kinds of phone platforms. Thank so that might be one of the first real-world, real multi-operator real uh, test pads, if you like, to see how this works in the real world. You know, um, those type of applications are, are really very basic. What's different in the applications is that it's standards based. And I think as we talk to a lot of our service providers, they're saying, well, don't tie me to IMS. I may not necessarily go there anytime soon, but I do need those features and functions. So if you can give me that, uh, that would be great. The other thing that we see quite a bit is this whole new element that is added, and it's about mobility. And that's, that's the tricky part, that it's not just that you need to have these applications, you need to have that experience seamless as you move either from device to device or network to network. Uh, and then I'd like to ask you a little bit, unless you wanted to interject with a comment first. I, I want to do, I, I want to put a comment. There is the whole other aspect of the enterprise, right? And the enterprise must be ready and willing to allow these applications to connect to the intranet their corporate applications, right? And so, you know, there's a whole aspect of security, the connectivity, and all of that, which we also need to take a look at, because that is the seamless end-to-end -end connectivity solution that we have to have, because there are today, uh, you know, applications available on multiple platforms that allow you, for example, IAM presence across various IAM platforms right, in a single uh, system. But, they compromise your password potentially and your login because they store it on a common server somewhere. And most enterprises do not allow that connectivity. But I would love to have that. Yeah, and funny, I saw a news story today about some of the app providers, I think in the US, that have a federal subpoena served against them for giving out end user application data without the user's consent. Now these were all consumer applications, not business. But if it's a problem on the consumer side, one would think it may also be on the business side as well. Um, I wanted to just continue on with this conversation about the enterprise applications. Now, with smartphones and other devices, we essentially have the equivalent of a smart PC and a mobile device. What are the business apps that are really right to be implemented on a smartphone or other sort of mobile device? You know, where should we as the industry vendors, the service providers, the major enterprises, where should we put our effort to get bang for buck? I think you should be able to just take the entire office experience that we have on our computer and transform that into a mobile experience, right? Uh, parts of it already exist. So for example, I can't see my email, but I cannot open all my attachments, right? I can reply to the email, but I really have a difficult time finding the corporate directory, right? Uh, yeah, I can accept uh, you know, uh, a meeting request, but it's very difficult to create a meeting request, right? And when I have a conference call, you know, I, I want to one touch if it's a phone call. You just press you know, accept and connect, and, and it should just connect me, and I should be on that call. But I have to scroll down and find the passcode, and I have to find the number to call, and all of that, right? So from that experience, I think we could take that on to the video, right? You know, we're still on voice. If we could have a truly unified experience in terms of uh, you, know, you have to join a meeting, it's a voice meeting, you get an email, you press the button, you accept it at the time, the uh, uh, reminder comes up, you hit a single button and you're on the call. Right? Because it's a secure device, it's a mobile phone, right? and it knows who it is. But I haven't seen such an application like this for enterprise, right? So this is one of the examples. So we should have a seamless experience of taking the office with us when we are on the mobile phone. Natasha, you look like you want to jump in. There's a 
really nice little video on Jen Van's website. <laughs> 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 this this capability is actually available today. Oh, thank you. Um, I mean, I think but to the point that you're making, this is this is a really important element. Um, unless the experience is seamless, if you have to go to one client to do one thing, launch another client to do something else, you get the phone number, but not the you know the get one password. Yeah. All of those different things, unless it is seamless, like it has been made on the in the enterprise, it it, it just does not work. So there is, I mean, I I, I simplify or simplify it as that we just integrate it into the There is, of course, the effort required to make that experience seamless. And I would add that some of the effort actually needs to be in the business process reengineering. Um, a friend of mine who's the CEO of the company was saying that you know she couldn't get one of her contractors paid because the hiring company, the HR company, wanted to have a signature on a document. She was doing this on her mobile. And you know, she had given the voice authorization, email authorization, had her PA sign something and scan it and fax it over, and the company still didn't want to pay the temporary worker, which is just ridiculous. Um, you know, there's a lot of back-end stuff that's not technological that has to happen. Yes. But I just just jump in on sort of a I think it's really interesting. We have these conversations a lot about recreating what we do on PCs or at work on a mobile environment. But an area that I think, which is very smart for related and has completely and utterly been neglected right now, is that when I'm a consumer and I'm talking to a business, um, this thing goes dark, right? The phone is dim during that conversation. And we've heard this phrase, digital real estate, and branded real estate, and nothing is happening here to add any kind of context to that call when I'm talking to an enterprise. It would be great, for example, that a very simple note if I'm calling up my pizza hut that they could show me. The, it would be great if during that I could show them my location for delivery. But what if I'm calling United Airlines and I get stuck in an IDR, which I do so often, they could push the IDR map here to my phone so I can go there and know exactly what to click on next. What if when I'm calling the call center and it tells me call back when we're less busy. How do I know? I don't know what time zone they're in. I don't know how busy they are. But there could be an app on here that pushes that status to me where I can book a time to pull back as a priority customer. We're not doing enough with a smartphone to add context. We're fixating with, well, let's recreate what we've done here. here. And I think this just opens up a whole new world. It most certainly does, and I think the question for operators is how do you make money out of it? If it's an app that actually does it, uh, it's bypassing the operator, you know, it's going voice over IP instead of voice over the cellular network, who makes the money? Um, and that actually brings me to the next topic, which is, you know, the cost about mobile broadband. And, you know, I'll give you an example from Australia, and I know the tariffs are different everywhere in the world. I did a, uh, a benchmark study a couple of weeks ago that's not published, so this is new information. The median price per gigabyte of data on fixed networks in Australia is 30 cents per gigabyte. If I look at post-paid mobile plans, you know, these are data plans, dongles and things, the median price is $5.27. If I look at prepaid plans, it's $16.67. Huge, huge differences. So what can be done to bring the cost of mobile broadband applications in line with fixed broadband? You know, what can the vendors do? What can the service providers do? So Natasha, you know, being a vendor, I'll ask you, you know, are there any tricks up your sleeve that you can yeah, help? Yeah, we, we certainly do. And uh, we've been working with some cost service providers, and this has been one of the big uh, problem statements from them, how do we make money um, from, from, you know, the traffic that's going through. And actually, one of the things that we have been working with is that actually you have more to play with. In the sense that when you were looking at fixed line voice, it was voice and SMS, there's not much room. Uh, here, if you have intelligence built into the solutions, you have the ability to analyze what is the different types of traffic. As an example, we have a service provider today who's uh, deploying um, our uh, deep packet inspection technology. Uh, one of the, this particular service provider had a, had a plan where they had usage-based model and they could see, you know, after a certain level it got capped and then they said, well, now I want some interesting way to be able to monetize what, what's out there. Now, because we had a DPI engine in their network, we had the ability to look at their traffic usage and find out what are the kinds of behavior 
that the subscribers are using. For example, are they interested in premium voice? Do they want a better gaming experience? Do they want better video experience by definition? And as we had a solution for that, as we could understand that, we could offer these solutions by sending some triggers to the end users on behalf of our service providers to offer these as options for them. And we saw that there was a tremendous take for this type of application because it resonated with the end consumers. Because consumers, for example, wanted uh, gaming files or they wanted premium video. And they were willing to pay for that at a click of a button. And this type of integration through policy and DPI technology is something that we're seeing quite a bit that's happening. So if I, if I take that personalization. If I take that example further in the unified comms environment for enterprise users, let's say you have um, a remote call center agent who happens to be working on his or her mobile, you might be able to do deep packet inspection of the different kinds of streams that they're using. The database access, the voice channel, the video channel, the instant messaging channel, and so on and rate it perhaps a different way so that the cost of broadband doesn't skyrocket. Yeah, I mean, one of the examples that we had as a service provider who, of course, was an enterprise, um, they had enterprise customers, and these enterprise customers, of course, did their work stuff on the phone, but they also used the same phone, and they were using it as an iPod, and they were streaming videos and music and things like that all the time. So the, the enterprise wanted to be able to isolate what's happening do they really have this much enterprise traffic or is it something else? And once they found out they had policies within their enterprise to you know, limit this in an intelligent and non-disruptive way for their And then as a service provider, is that an attractive op potential option or application for you? No, absolutely. I would say that uh, from uh, the usage, to be able to uh, bundle in more rich applications, be able to actually understand the, the Access and how they're using it; those those are the you know, the, the sweet spots. Uh, but having said that, I, you know, you were talking about the costs per gigabyte of access. Uh, so I got an SMS when I landed. Welcome to Malaysia. And it was twelve dollars for a megabyte. Yes, I have seen pricing on phone plans in Australia that was two cents per kilobyte. You know, in you know, just the type of person who actually does any massive downloading here for a nasty bill shop. You know, be very, very wealthy. But you know, there's another twist to this. So let's say you do DPI in your own network as a mobile operator, but what happens to the poor user when they roam internationally? You know, what sort of things can we do that allow an unified communications business application to be deployed to users who are not just in one operator's turf? Maybe they're roaming in the United States between different operators' territory, or maybe they're doing something like flying between the U.S. and Malaysia, or any other Asian countries in Malaysia or anywhere else. Steve, do you have a view on that? Yeah, I do. Um, I mean, it's interesting for me when I when I roam internationally, I, I get life-threatening emails from my IT department, basically saying, "Turn off your phone, never turn it on, throw it away, um, don't even touch it; it will cost us too much money." Um, so what do I do? I get on Wi-Fi, I pull up Skype, I, I heat the system. I call home so basically you go around the operators. Yeah, exactly. And, and I go off brand, I leave the at home, I leave the service providers, at and I leave that brand behind. Um, we've been working hard on a, on a twin soft phone solution, which basically allows you to completely recreate on this mobile phone, but in a, in a soft environment. So a complete replica of every feature you'd expect on the mobile phone in the soft phone environment. Um, basically meaning that when I roam now, um, that mobile phone can also be on my PC. That actually a soft client could run on this, I could have a phone on a phone, which is a remote business extension. And then it's up to me, and if the call comes in, I can answer it if I'm on an appropriate data plan. And, you know, it's funny, when I talk about that, people say, well, you know, why would a service provider offer you that? Um, because then they are losing the international revenue, and my point is, they're not getting that revenue from me today. I'm not using the service because of that sensitivity with the IT department. Um, if they offer me something equipment, I stay on brand, they bundle it in, I stay a happy customer. So yeah, well, another way to defeat it is to actually change the roaming cost model, right? Well, you could. Or to have interoperability agreements between operators to be able to deploy enterprise applications that use these multiple yeah. modalities. Yeah, we try to focus on the things that we can change. Um, yes. Um, we only have a couple of minutes, so I'd love to just throw out to the audience to see if there are any questions. 
nobody. I think everybody's had a very, very long afternoon. So what I would like to do is just ask one more um, question of the panel, and that is, can you think of any examples of unified columns in vertical markets that use mobility as well? You know, any financial applications, any healthcare applications, anything that's neat that might spur some ideas for people in the audience? Yeah, I mean, um, in the last several months, let's put it this way, uh, GenBan actually opened up our application server to the uh, vertical market in the sense that uh, we opened up APIs for such users. And it's interesting that uh, some of the enterprises uh, who are the customers of our service providers have taken advantage of that and uh, built it into applications, for example, medical applications, medical monitoring applications. So one of the things that I showed you on my screen uh, earlier today, um, that's, that's, that's the type of application that um, enterprises are looking for, where they have um, these types of applications built in, these newer applications that are built in, which have mobility. So as the subscribers are moving from location to location, network to network, uh, these applications are, are aware of their presence on their location. And this location awareness comes in because our application servers uh, happen to have mobility aspect or uh, continuity or presence applications with it as well. And by showing verticals, it's actually quite a tangible application that you can show a CIO and they can immediately say, I got it, I'm in the healthcare business, that will help me. Any other examples before we wrap up? We've got about one minute. Yeah, I think real quick, one thing that's, that's interesting to me is sure, we talked about in call content sharing. You can imagine applications where a doctor is sharing an X-ray with you, or um, you know, the mechanic is showing you a spare part and you need to turn out the right one. But just when you started that question, you talked about unified communications. Yes. Just the, the thought I'll leave people with is that I'm not sure we're unifying anymore. I think we're diversifying. I mean, I pick up my phone and I have about 15 ways to make a phone call. I'm never quite sure which is the best one. I'm never quite sure which plan. So what I think we should do is, is, is kind of unify this experience. Of it. Well, I should go to pick this up. I should go to swipe left for business. Now we can set up my business environment and swipe right for personal. And now I'm the personal environment. That would make my life more easy. That's the unified experience. At the moment, we're splitting my open page. I think service providers can solve that. And as the service provider on the panel, I'll give you one last chance to add a thought to the audience, and then we will break for. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks for the opportunity. So I would take my one minute to talk about telepresence, right? And that allows you to person meetings across multiple locations. Today, of course, it's not available on the device. Uh, but with the Global Meeting Exchange, or the Global Meeting Alliance that uh, telecommunication was driving, uh, we're looking for anywhere, anytime, any device connectivity to the telepresence exchange. And that will allow you actually to be have an in-person, almost face-to-face -face meetings remotely and sharing documents and collaborate. Right? So that is the vision in terms of having a collaborate unified communication and uh, application. And certainly some of the gadgets that I've been talking about that enable that kind of telepresence and augmented reality. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our panel, Natasha, Steve, and Alex.